Which do you feel like? Wait for it. dizzy. There's two options, so don't answer yet. Do you feel like this? Or do you feel like this? (laughs) Now, before we go any further, I ask the Lord, Lord, why do you give me such, like, Pity demonstrations for, for, for like youthy. John MacArthur and Timothy Keller and Billy Graham probably don't use a balloon. <laughs> and this is all he said to me. He said, Tim, are there kids in the sanctuary in the house of God? I said, yes. That was it. <laughs> we want all people to understand this very thing. Which are you? As you sit here today, no one else can answer this question for you, but are you full of life? And when I'm talking about full of life, I'm not just talking about your body. I'm talking about the spirit that's inside of you. As we've walked through the season that we walked through, as you walked through this last week, as you got here this morning, are you full of life or are you more like this? Jesus said this in John chapter 10, verse 10. He gave two job descriptions, one for the devil, one for himself. He said the devil's job description is to steal, kill, and destroy. He's going to steal your joy, kill your body, and destroy your spirit, your soul. Make it look like this, right? Jesus then said, but I have come, me, to the earth that everyone may have life, and not just a little bit of life, but he uses one word. He says abundant life. Everyone say abundant. Abundant. Yeah. You know what abundantly means? That your first reaction would be, well, it means just like I'm overflowing or I have more than enough, which is true, but it's not the fullness of the definition. Give me a minute here. Do my cheeks look weird when I do this? You're lying. Abundance means and can only mean abundance when every part of you is full. You can't have a part of a balloon that's not filled up and it be full. You see what I'm saying? The whole thing has to be full in order for life to be full. Abundance is only abundant if all of you is abundant. So if you're jamming at work, woo, things are awesome. But your home life, right? If, I'm going to blow it up less this time. You've got a lot of knowledge about who God is. You understand pretty well this word, but you're not living it out there for the world to know who the King of Kings is. You're just a lot of education, but no living of the gospel. I wonder what that sounds like online. (laughs) If your relationships are pretty amazing, you're married, That relationship, your work relationships, your friendships, your relationship with your mom, your brothers and sisters. That's great. But in your personal disciplines, the way that you eat, the way that you sleep, the way that you get into or don't get into the word of God in prayer, if your personal disciplines are not abundant, then according to the understanding of what Jesus came to do, this word abundance, then you're not living abundantly. And God said, I come that you could have abundance. And yet through this past season that we've been living in, it's been feeling like we're not living in abundance. But I've got good news for you. Every single person here, every person watching online, because Jesus said this is what he came to do, I believe 100% every single one of us could live the abundant life, which means all areas of your life abundant. So we can list some areas that we're doing well in, but there's always, it seems, one or two areas over here that we never seem to get over the hump in. It's personal for each person. 
Whatever it is, that one relationship you can't just get right, that one sin that you keep returning to, this one pattern of, I don't even know what it is for you, but it feels like this part's always lagging behind, and eventually we say, it's just going to be that way. And God said, I came to give you life abundantly. So every area, including that one, can be healed and ministered to and brought out to be an abundant part of your life, an abundant part of your life, as opposed to this little shriveled up, part of your life. It's the good news that God has for us today. But here's the thing. It's the name of the series. In order for us to have this abundant life, it's going to take more than Sunday. It's going to take more than this time that we're sitting here together on a Sunday morning. I've got a lot more to say about exactly how many hours we spend with the Lord next week. It's very interesting. But I want you to know that God wants us to end this year thinking about a life of abundance that happens as we participate with the Lord our God on more than Sunday. I'm glad that you're here, by the way. Sunday's great. Don't exclude Sunday. Just add on to Sunday is what we're saying. The Lord wants to give us abundance of love, abundance of peace, abundance of joy. You'll know you're living with abundant love when you can forgive that one person that you haven't been able to forgive because love is expressed in forgiveness. You'll know that you have this peace from God when the bad news comes, because the bad news always comes. It's coming. If it's not here already, it's coming. It just comes. It's part of the brokenness of this earth. The bad news comes and you stay steadfast, knowing that God is faithful. Even when we're faithless, he remains faithful. And so we're steadfast. I have peace, shalom, because he's God and I trust him. And everlasting, uh, abundant joy is really exhibited, lived, when we live a life of gratitude, an attitude of gratitude. Because joy literally means grace recognized. It's not an emotion, though it could be expressed through an emotion. But it means I recognize that the breath that I just breathed came from God. It's a grace, a gift given to me. And so I participate with joy saying, thank you, God, for my breath. Thank you, God, for my job. Thank you, God, for my family. And it's very hard to say thank you, God, and really mean it and not smile. Go ahead. I just want you to say thank you, God, right there where you're sitting. Just think of someone say thank you, God, and see if you don't smile. Some of you are like, I'm not going to smile. Go ahead. Try I want you to say thank you, God. Say it until you smile. Thank you, God. God. Now you're just smiling because I'm making a nuisance up here, but it's all good. Mm -hmm. And I just want to pause here and talk about abundance. It's not a self-centered concept. It's not all about me, as Toby Keith once sang it, but I sounded terrible singing it. Because abundance sounds like Jesus came down so that I could feel awesome in all areas of my life. And so if I'm blessed, I'm good. Is it all about self-centeredness, this abundance? And even our mission statement here at Illuminate Church is to help people find abundant life in Jesus. And is that the end? Once you're abundant, like, I'm good. Forget about the rest of y'all. Here's the truth. It is impossible for abundant people to be self-centered. It's impossible. The opposite abundance, you could say, is scarcity. And the scarcity mindset says, wow, there's not enough, so I better get enough, hog it to me, just in case we run out. I don't know if you grew up with brothers. I had two brothers, and if they put four hot dogs out and there's three of us, I take two just because there might not be more later. You know what I'm talking about? That's the scarcity mindset. There's not going to be enough, so I better look out for numero uno. I'm going to take care of myself. It's self-centered. That happens when you live in the scarcity mindset. But if you live with abundance in your life, you have always more than enough because you serve a God who his name is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. His grace is sufficient for me. I just sang the song, but I spoke it. And there's always enough. There's free refill, so I can give you everything that I have because the Lord is providing it. It's called generosity. And abundant people are generous because if I am abundant, then it means that even the part of me that wants to be self-centered and focused on me is healed by Jesus. It's abundant too. And so it's just natural for me because I'm living the abundant life to want to share it with you. There's more than enough. There's always enough. I'm going to share it with you. Here it comes. Here it comes. There's a test that you can give yourself to ask if you're living in abundance. It's pretty simple. It's just this, like, God, am I sharing what you've poured into me? Time, talent, resources, gifts and treasures, love, forgiveness, compassion. Am I giving that away the same way that you have given it to me? That's a test of abundance in your life, or is it scarcity? I'm not sure that I'm going to have enough, so I'm going to cling on to it. And we end up looking like this, by the way, in the mind of scarcity. So how do we live abundantly? 
I don't know if you've ever played a video game with a young person in these days. I'm 48, my son down here is 19, and uh, he has asked me in the past to sit down and play a game on PS4. And the first thing that he does is hand me a remote that has 12 more buttons than I grew up with. <laughs> Somebody remember Atari? One little stick up and the orange button right there. The joystick and the button. That's all we had, and we were satisfied. All this, I guess it's abundance. So he hands you buttons, and there's like three buttons for these fingers, and like 19 buttons, and two joysticks, or maybe three, and and by the time I'm done looking at the machine in my hand, Owen's already pressed like 600 buttons, I've pressed one, and I look up and I've lost the game. (laughs) What just happened? Like, you're dead. I, I didn't know. And so here's what happens. I put the remote down, I speak a statement to him like this, do you know what the PS and PS4 stands for? pretty stupid, something like that. (laughs) And then I stomp off to my room and walk away from playing anymore, right? This is make-believe, by the way. That hasn't actually happened in our household, but it's what it feels like to me when I'm playing video games against them. And here's what I'm trying to say. You can't take somebody who's never been in that world and drop them into that complexity and say, did you figure it out? Are, Are you okay? Because if you do, what ends up happening to that person is like, no, I didn't figure it out. I'm confused, and I'm going to make a statement that's true to me but isn't actually true. PS4, pretty stupid, whatever. And I'm going to walk away from doing this anymore because it's too complex. And you didn't tell me how. You just said good luck. And I believe that this is a problem that's happened in the church where we say, hey, come to the abundant life. There is greatness involved when we have this relationship with Jesus and the blessing and all this stuff. Did you, did you, did you figure it out? Did, do you understand? Because the rest of us got it, and we're awesome. And it's happening. It's so good. And did you get it? And here's what happens. People come to church, and they know that there's something there, but they can't get it because they don't know that they understand the 16 buttons and all this kind of stuff, and we just drop them into it. And here's what happens. They're like, now I feel defeated. Because I came here thinking that I was getting an answer, and all I got is confused. And so I walk away and make a statement that's true to me, but it's actually false, which says the church doesn't help. It actually hurts. And let me extrapolate that. God doesn't actually help. He hurts. And then they walk away from it. Like, ah, it's, it's, this church thing's not for me. It's too confusing. The, the church people, myself included, we use too much Christianese. We forget how much we know. And so I just come out and say, open your Bible to the book of Job. I thought it was job, right? And we don't slow down and say, this is how. And so what we want to do in this series called More Than Sunday is tell you how to find abundant life. But let me tell you now, let me tell you later, it takes more than Sunday. It's going to take more than Sunday. And you're going to be blessed. And you're going to feel full and alive. The way that we're going to do that is by diving deep into the first people who experienced abundant life in Jesus. It was the disciples, which if you're new to church, just means a follower of a certain teacher. The certain teacher happened to be Jesus. He's their rabbi. And these men and women followed Jesus and experienced the abundant life. When the Lord told us at Illuminate Church, stop making church fans, illuminators, and make disciples, we said, well, let's study the Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and understand how Jesus made disciples. How he got them there. And if we understand how they got there, then we can do this too. And we, we noted that there are four things that the people who followed Jesus, the disciples, did repeatedly. They didn't do it once. They didn't do it twice, three times. They did it repeatedly in their time with him. And as a result, they ended up living the abundant life. And you can too. Here are the four things. I'm going to say them quickly to you. Number one, they met with God. In their case, it's straight up Jesus on the earth. Kind of jealous, but I got the Holy Spirit, so... Not a bad second place, not even second place. First, first place. They met with God. They met him first in relationship, and then they abided with him after that, meeting with him regularly. It wasn't just a first time meet and then like, oh. The second thing they did is they discovered who they were in Jesus. Meaning as they met Jesus, Jesus confessed to them, helped them understand who they really were. Not who they thought they were or who the world thought they were, but they told them, he told each of them their identity. And next Sunday, we're going to talk about identity. There's an identity crisis on the face of the planet like never before. 
and we're going to dive into what it means to have a true identity in Jesus. I hope that you be here. Discover who you are in Jesus. The third thing they did repeatedly was become more and more like Christ. As they spent time with him, they took on his nature. They treated people the way that Jesus treated people. They treated people the way Jesus treated them. Like loving and accepting and I'm going to do the same. And finally, what they did was they led others to do the same. These four things, meet God, discover who you are in Christ, become more and more like Jesus, and lead others to do the same, is how Jesus made disciples. And it's how we're committed to making disciples here at Illuminate Church. If you've been to Life Step 1 or Life Step 2, you've heard these things before. If you haven't, join us. The next one's December 5th. You'll hear me say that again. So we're going to open up the Bible. If you're brand new... We're going to be in the New Testament, one of the Gospels called the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you have a Bible, take it out. The New Testament is that place where Jesus is on the earth, and these Gospels tell the story about Jesus' time on the earth. And then after the Gospels, you have all these other books that explain the birth of the church and how the church should operate to reach people for the kingdom. And it ends with the book of Revelation, which talks about the new beginning at the end of this world. But it's a new beginning of a glorious new world that we talked about last week. So we're in the Gospel of John, the first chapter, and every chapter is broken down into verses. We're starting in verse 35. Are you ready? Come on, you had an extra hour to sleep and that's all you got? Are you ready? Hallelujah. Here we go. The next day, John was there. This is John the Baptist. And he's at the river where he was baptizing. And he's there with two of his disciples. John was a rabbi. He was a teacher. He had disciples following him. When he, John, saw Jesus passing by, John the Baptist said, look, it's the Lamb of God. (laughs) What a moment. Now, John's disciples would have known this language. It would have been very apparent to them what he was talking about. It may sound weird to us, but they were familiar with the Lamb. A little bit of church history really quick. The people of God before Jesus arrived on the earth were enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. Enslaved, making bricks, doing the work under the whip to the Egyptians. God sent a deliverer named Moses to go and set God's people free. He went to Pharaoh and said, God said, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, I don't care. No. And God said, okay, I'm going to send plagues upon the Egyptians until they allow the Israelites to go. And one plague after another didn't convince Pharaoh. He sometimes changed his mind, but then he changed it right back. Yes, you go, no, never mind, no, you can't. Until the final plague came, and it was the plague of death. And the plague sent against the Egyptians was to take the firstborn of every family. But here's what the Lord did. He said to his people that he had set apart, that were supposed to make his name famous on the earth. He said, I want you to sacrifice a lamb, and I want you to paint the blood of that lamb and above the door. And when the spirit of death enters the nation and sees the blood of the sacrificed lamb upon the door, that spirit of death will pass over that house and move on to the houses, the homes that don't have the blood of fire. That's where we get the, prayer, the phrase, the, the event called Passover, that's still celebrated to this day by the Jewish people. That the spirit of death would pass over where he saw the blood of the Lamb. And so when John says, look, it's the Lamb of God, these two disciples who happen to be Andrew and another guy named John, who wrote the Gospel of John, they know what it means. This is the Lamb that will be sacrificed. Take away the sting of sin from the world. This is the one. And they know what it means, and it's so moving to them just to hear these words, the Lamb of God. That's all they, these two fellows needed to hear. Look what they do next, verse 37. When the two disciples heard John say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? He didn't say it like that. It's not really bad. What do you want? The, another Bible translation that some of you might have is sitting there in your laps. He says, what do you see? Jesus is asking them, what is the point of you following? What is it that you are actually searching for in your heart, in your spirits? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, this is what we're searching for. Where are you staying? This isn't like small talk, chit chat. What's the address of your abode? And he's like 1600. It's not a location. They're asking, Lord, what is your abiding like? Wherever you're going. Whatever you are doing, can we come with you? Can we abide with you? Where are you 
saying. This is why Jesus replies in verse 39. He doesn't say where he's going. He doesn't like lie to him over there behind that bush. He says, come, and you will see. These five words make the gospel in just a short statement. Come, and you will see. There's an invitation, and there's also the expectation of what happens when you do come and you will see. Very interesting. Keep that in your mind. So they, Andrew and John, went and saw where Jesus was staying, and they spent that day with him until it was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said about the Lamb of God and who had followed Jesus. Verse 41, then the first thing Andrew did was to find his own brother Simon and to tell him, we found the Messiah. That is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Okay, I'm going to say this now. I'm going to repeat it a lot of times in this reading of the scriptures. So brace yourself. But if something is found, it means it was either stumbled upon, like, oh, it's a dime. And pick up the dime. Or if something is found, it was found because somebody was looking for it or him. That. And we know based on what we just read that Andrew and John, as Israelites, had been searching, waiting, looking for Messiah to the point that when we heard, there he is, they immediately got up and followed him. They found Jesus because they were searching for him. Hold that in your hat. Jesus looked at them and said, looked at him, Peter, and said, You are Simon, son of John, you will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. So beautiful. So much goodness right here. Jesus says, hey, right now, this is who you are. You are Simon. But one day you will be called Cephas, which translated as Petra, Peter, which means rock. And on this rock, Jesus builds his church, and the gates of hell cannot stand against it. But right now you're Simon. But I am declaring over your life this new name that you will be Peter. Be like Jesus visiting me. Back in ninth grade when I was 13 and said, hey, Timothy, son of Wally, you will be named pastor. Where? What? On earth. It's a beautiful, powerful statement that Jesus is making to Simon. In verse 43, the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Now, I told you I'd repeat this, but if Jesus found Philip, what does that mean? Somebody just shout out. You could be wrong. It's okay. He was searching for him. Who said that? 100 points for Gryffindor. What's up, Nikki? Good job. She's brand new to church, already yelling out. I love it. Jesus found Philip because Jesus was looking for Philip. He was searching for him. Very good. Let's continue. Verse 44. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. The son of Joseph. <laughs> there it is again, by the way. Philip found two things. Philip first finds Nathaniel. Tell me, why did Philip find Nathaniel? Because he was looking for him. And then they say, and he says, we have found the Messiah. Tell me, why did he find the Messiah? Everyone, because he was looking for him. He's looking for him. I told you we're going to repeat it. This is the third time I repeat it. It's the third time. We've all been charmed. That's how it goes. Verse 46, Nazareth, Nathaniel replies, can anything good come from Nazareth? In his mind, and basically back then in the time, Nazareth was this po-dunky sinful city. What good could come from Nazareth? And what's happening here is Nathaniel's doing what we often do. God moves in a mighty way. He invites us. And the first thing that we say is our reason not to. Well, let me say something contrary. Let me not believe first and just put a defense up like it's no. Nazareth, Jesus, it can't be. And Philip says to him, come and see. You don't have to believe me. You're invited personally. And this sounds very familiar. Jesus offered an invitation. Andrew and John accepted it and did see Jesus and did believe. Now Philip says the same thing because he's seen Jesus and he believes. And he says to his brother or his friend, Nathaniel, I invite you to come and experience this for yourself. Come, meet Jesus. It's what disciples do. They meet with God. And by the way, let me just pause here and say this. 
The people who experience abundant life are disciples. They are followers of Jesus. You can't skirt around and find another way to abundant life. You follow it by becoming a disciple, a follower of Jesus, and through that way you experience abundant life, and that's what's happening here for these guys. And eventually, a bunch of women too. A bunch of people become disciples. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Verse 48, Nathanael says, how do you know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. And this may be all somebody needs to hear today, and you can just take a nap after this. But at some point in your life, maybe you have felt far from God. Maybe you feel that right here today. And you're wondering, am I even on God's radar? And his words to Nathaniel are such a comfort to us, because even when Nathaniel wasn't looking, Jesus said, I saw you then. While you're still in the fig tree, you weren't even looking yet. I certainly saw you when you started looking, but even before that. So today, I need you just to hear this. God sees you. He sees you in what you're walking through. You're not alone. The devil wants you to think you're alone. It's a trick of the enemy. But God sees you under the fig tree. And he knows your nature and he knows your character and he comes to you. He meets with you. He celebrates with you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel, and this is it. Nathanael sees because he accepted the invitation. First he went and met with Jesus. Then he sees, and now he believes, and he believes to the extent that he confesses with his mouth, you are the son of God. You're the king of Israel. It's the whole picture together. He received the invitation, met with Jesus, now makes a declaration of faith. Perhaps God does feel distant or maybe it's like a dream. Everyone else talks about him, but he's not personal, doesn't know me. Well, it's true for the disciples and it's true for us. A few things from the scripture. Write this down. Those who look, find. It's a biblical truth throughout the entirety of the scriptures. We said it kind of overly too much, over embellished it a little bit, that those who look, find. After 70 years of captivity, God's people, they're in Babylon because of disobedience. They're captives there. And the prophet, the one who hears from God and speaks for God, the prophet Jeremiah wrote this down that God wanted them to hear. He says, you, while you're in captivity, will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart, all of your heart. Verse 14, these great words, God says to humanity, I am will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. Such great news. If you feel bonded today to anything in any way, Jesus says to us, the Lord says through Jeremiah, I will be found by you. Jesus takes this theme into the old, the new, from the Old Testament into the New Testament. He says in Matthew chapter 7, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. He says also in Matthew chapter 5 verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Hungering and thirsting are seeking, searching words. If we ask, we seek, we knock, we find. It's a biblical truth. God is not stingy with his love, withholding it from you. When you seek him, you will find him when you seek him with your whole heart. And therein lies the truth of this morning. It takes more than Sunday to seek him with all our heart. It takes Monday morning when the kids are late for school. It takes Tuesday afternoon when the work project isn't done yet and you just want to throw up your hands or just throw up. It takes all those moments in between To seek him with our whole heart. Not just on Sunday. Although Sunday's great. Here's what happens. Oh, by the way, not only are you seeking God, but I want you to know that Jesus is also seeking you and he finds you. Whether you realize it or not, God finds you. You ever stood on the shore? The sun is starting to depart from the day. And just at that moment, you know that moment, all the colors of the sky just become brilliant. The blues and the pinks and the purples. And some of the sun shoots through the clouds. It's like these big beams standing there. And the ocean is lapping at the the shore there. And it's just this moment. You're like, wow. 
you get, a, you get a moment of awe. It could be anywhere in creation. You're just like, whoa, and I'm telling you, in that moment, God found you. What I mean is that he walked in front of you like, hey, the majesty of the skies speak to my glory. I created this, hoping that you would see it one day and go, oh, my God. You ever held a newborn baby? Have you? About to have a newborn baby right down here, Miss Kaylee. Mm-hmm. Miss Bree about to have a baby too. Anyone else? Come on. Hey, hallelujah. When you hold the life of a precious brand new baby in your hands and think to yourself, how in the world? There was nothing, now there's this. In that moment when you have that awe and wonder, God's like, I found you. I'm right here. I, I made life this creative moment to catch your breath for you to say, oh my God. Have you ever received a gift that you absolutely didn't deserve? Like, I was not nice enough, kind enough to receive this great thing, yet you have done this great thing. That's God saying, I found you. Right here, right now. I found you. Or if you've ever been in a pit so low that you thought you'd never get out, and yet you made it out, and you stand on the other side and like, how did that happen? It's God saying, I found you. It's called prevenient grace. It's the grace that goes before you enter into a relationship with him. It's all the things that God does to get your attention to say, I'm here. I love you. I want relationship with you. Creation, awes, wonders, gifts, God's hand on your life. It's God saying, I found you. The question is, will you respond? Because when he finds you, he gives us the invitation, which is to come, come and meet with Jesus is what the disciples did. It's the beginning of abundant life. This may be a no-brainer, but it needs to be stated. The disciples don't become disciples if they haven't first met Jesus. There's nothing that follows if they say, and you know what? And Nathaniel's like, ah, no, never mind. I'm just going to walk away or just sit here under the fig tree. But it was an invitation. And because Nathaniel responded to the invitation, everything else came after it. None of those disciples would have ever experienced the abundant life of God that God had given them if they had not first met Jesus. And here's the truth. Neither will we. All the things that God wants to give us flow out of first meeting God, meeting Jesus meaning the Holy Spirit. Maybe a no-brainer, but if it was such a no-brainer, then why does the church look like this? Because we're not meeting with God. Now, we might have met with him at the beginning of our salvation experience, which is that moment where we say, God, you are who you say you are. You did send your son Jesus to earth to redeem me from my sins, and I receive his invitation into relationship by faith. Through God's grace, I am saved. Praise God. You have a relationship with Jesus now. That's salvation. What's missing is now abiding, repeatedly meeting with God over and over. And abiding takes more than Sunday. Way more than Sunday. Here's what happens after you receive the invitation. The expected outcome is that you seeing is believing. Again, the order is so important. If you want to believe, you first have to see, but you can't see if you don't accept the invitation to go and see, to meet with God. We've stopped as a church meeting with God besides on Sunday, which again, please, online, Sunday's so important, but we need to add to it. It's more than Sunday. Uh, I, I just went this past week on a personal retreat. I was gone Sunday night, tried to leave celebration during Halloween. Bad idea. Took me like an hour to get from my house up to like Chipotle. It was crazy. So I finally got over to the beach. This person in our house, uh, in our church, loaned me their beach house. It's way too big, but it was just me in this massive house and God. But it took a while for God to show up. So I thought. What it turned out to be is that God was never hiding when I went looking. It turned out that I had just covered him up. I don't know if you've ever done that. 
God's like, I'm here the whole time. So really when you're looking for me, what you're doing is uncovering all the things you've put on top of me that make you not see me. Remove those things, purge them, and you seek me, you'll find me. And we met, we had an incredible time together, meeting the, and the, the father. He dispensed to me a whole bunch of personal things, but he also dispensed to me a whole bunch of stuff for the church. Next year in 2022, I can't wait to share it with you. You have to wait till January, sorry, but that's how it goes. But we met together, and it happened because I went away and looked for him. And I'm not special. Any one of us can do this, but it takes more than Sunday. you got to make a choice. I'm going to seek him today, right now, in this hour. And God says, when you do, you'll find me. And when you find me, you'll see. And when you see, you'll believe. Meaning, God's going to show you in his word, God's going to show you through other people, this is the way, walk in it. And you'll walk in it and you'll start to believe, like, oh my goodness, when I live the way that God told me to live, the abundance that I've dreamed about starts happening in my life. So I'm just going to close with this thought. The COVID kind of revealed something, this COVID season, uh, to all of us. And not all of us, but maybe most of us. We either were weaker spiritually at the beginning of COVID than we realized, but COVID revealed it, like, oh my gosh, I'm not as strong as I thought I was. Or you were strong, but the whole season kind of eroded your strength. So you might have been a big, strong balloon, but throughout this time, it's just been kind of like, like COVID, political tension, the election, all that, right? Just happens. Hmm. I want to introduce a concept to you that has been brought to my attention that the church is missing. It's this word called catechesis. Everyone say catechesis. There might be some people here who grew up in a church where they did catechism, which is essentially somebody catechizing you. There's a catechizer, literally there's a word, and a catechizee, that's the, the student, the catechizer is the teacher, and they're teaching you catechesis at catechism. I'm not making this up. Catechesis means learning from oral teaching. Let me read a quote to you. And it'll explain itself. What we're seeing is massive discipleship failure caused by massive catechesis failure. We don't have disciples because we're not doing catechesis. What is it? This is what uh, catechesis, uh, excuse me. James Ernest, the vice president and editor-in-chief of Erdman's, a publisher of religious books, told me this. Uh, by the way, Ernest was one of several figures I spoke with who pointed to catechism, the process of instructing and informing people through teaching as the source of the problem in the church today. Quote, the evangelical church in the United States over the last five decades has failed to form its adherents into disciples. So... There is great hollowness in the church. All that was needed to cause the implosion that we have seen was a sufficiently provocative stimulus, and that stimulus came. So when COVID hit, because we've lived as a church who exists only an hour on Sunday, and I'm talking about the church in general across the world, when COVID came, we felt like a house of cards. This happened in our spirits. I want to show you how catechism works. And I'm going to invite a guest up here who's going to be my catechizer, and I'm his catechizee. He's going to be the teacher. I want to be the student. Would you please welcome the one and only kindest, gentlest man on the planet, Pastor Valdemir Arnese. Come on. And he's handsome, too. Pastor Valdemir has been in ministry in the great country of Brazil for lots of years. And he led a church, but he also led a group of churches, 40 churches under this man's care, and he's been with us. I mean, his whole family makes up the tech team. Somebody told me yesterday, like, They're, that's all one family? I'm like, yes, isn't that amazing? Anyway, so I've asked Pastor Valdemir to teach me Portuguese. He's going to catechize me in Portuguese. I've not heard the phrase he's about to tell me ever in my life. This will be the first time we didn't practice this, and I'm going to attempt to speak it. Now, follow along. This all makes sense in just a minute. So, Pastor Valdemir, what is the phrase that I'm learning today? Vou passear com meu cachorro no parque. Easy, Pastor. <laughs> Vou choquear. Almost. Almost. Vou passear. Oh, vou passear. Com meu cachorro. Com meu cachorro. No parque. Low parque. 
Is that it? Uh, yeah. Seriously? <laughs> Vo Pacquiar, Lo Shaki. I forgot the middle part. Vo Pacquiar. Vo Pacquiar. Com meu cachorro. Com meu cachorro. No parque. No parque? No parque. Are you saying no? No. No. Parque. Parque. You Perfect. did a little brr thing. Parque. <laughs> What did I just say, by the way? Wait, no, hold on a second. Does anyone out here speak Portuguese besides Celia? Anyone else? Kind of? What what'd I say? <laughs> do not take, do not do something with my car? No. no! Hey, I'm so grateful for your courage. This guy's moving to Brazil to become a missionary with his wife there, and they're just learning Portuguese. Hey! <laughs> so... Well, this is a lesson for both of us, Caleb. So what did I actually say, Pastor? I walk my dog at the park. <laughs> <laughs> Two claps for Pastor Valdemir. You did a great job. So this is how catechesis works. I learn under oral teaching. He taught me orally, and then I try to repeat back to him what I'm hearing, and as I say it, he's correcting me along the way. He's forming my words to match his words. Over and over. By the way, I've already forgotten what it was, so I need more catechesis because I need more than Sunday, right? So here's how it works. The Lord God speaks to us, and then we go out and live. And then we come back and like, did I live that right? Did, did, I, did I display grace and kindness? Did I love and mercy? Did I, was I grateful? Did I do it right? And he'll say, well, yeah, 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 a little bit, but hey, try this. Do this under the counsel of his word. That's catechism. Constantly going back to the source, the authority, being under the breath of God and learning from him, letting him form us over and over until one day we go, God, did I get that right? And he's like, well done, my good and faithful servant. Right? That's catechism that's been missing in the church because all we get is one hour on Sunday. And most people forget a message within 48 minutes. And if you don't activate it within 48 hours, it's gone forever. We need more than Sunday, meaning we need to be under the counsel of God's word more regularly in the week. Here's how. Number one, get in a community group. We got tons of them. Love for you to join. Maybe you've been hanging out on the edge like, should I, do I have the time to? You can't afford not to. Be in a D group, which is a discipleship group. Incredible depth, getting into the word of God, being under the counsel of his word and sharpening ourselves. God, what did you say? Is that how I was supposed to say it? Is that how I was supposed to live it? That's catechism. You can also download the Bible app, version. They've got thousands of reading plans and every subject you can imagine. Just pick one and start getting under the counsel of the oral teaching of God in his word. Start praying. God speaks in prayer. Get under his word in prayer. Here's all I'm saying to you. God has promised that you can have life abundantly, but it's going to take more than Sunday. In fact, I'm just going to end with this one right here. I'm putting the microphone down. I just realized, I just realized this is how most of us live. This is deformed living. It's not abundant living. Let's make them abundant. Mm. Praise be to God. Would you all stand with me? Listen, the promise of abundance is for every person. You have to decide today if you want to live a half-life, a half-spirit-filled life, or the actual fullness of God in your life, and it takes more than Sunday. Community groups, discipleship groups, reading the Bible, in prayer, getting under the voice of God. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would instruct our hearts now. Lord, we don't want to leave with just a lot of information and do nothing but that you would guide every person here by the work of your gracious and good and gentle Holy Spirit and say, hey, I'm calling you in. 
I'm not calling you out. I'm not shaming you. I'm calling you in. Come into the abundance of life that the Lord God has promised. Come. Come. And you will see. You will see. It's a promise. Wherever you are in your life today, I promise you this. God is inviting you to more. More love, more grace, more understanding, more patience, more joy, and more peace. He has it for you. So we can do what he's asking us to do. We can do it. And in Jesus' name, we will do it. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, everyone said, amen. Glory be to God.